friends and welcome to today's program. I'm so glad that you joined me and today we're going to begin looking at a topic that you've heard me mention at the end of many of the programs that have gone before, that the life we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God. I've referenced it, we've previously been talking about the, the fact that God sets before us the choice of life or death, but what exactly does it mean to live our lives by the faith of God? That is a question we're going to begin looking at in today's program. Let's begin by asking the Holy Spirit for his help in our journey as we start looking at this, start you know, seeking out the truth about what this really means. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence, for guiding and leading us each day. I thank you for the people who are joining me and watching this video. I surround them with faith and love. We just thank you for giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior and all that he has accomplished for us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for being our redemptive sacrifice. We thank you for salvation in all that you've provided through your death, burial, and resurrection. Help us to come to a place of understanding, revelation, knowledge, and thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, our guide, and our comforter. And Father, we thank you for sending Jesus and we give you all praise and glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin today in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and see where the Holy Spirit takes us from there. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to focus in on that phrase, the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 6, we get a, a, a kind of a picture of how important it is for us to learn about this faith. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice it says two things here that we should really start paying attention to as we move forward and start looking at this. It is impossible to please God without faith. That means that anything done outside of faith cannot please God. Anything that we do in our own effort, anything that we do in our own plan, and many Christians today will put together a plan and then ask God to bless it. But if you look at this verse right here, asking God to bless our plans is not a prayer that will be answered because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it is impossible to release the faith of the Son of God to fulfill our plans. We must find his plan and pursue that for our lives. To do that, though, the writer of Hebrews gives us a hint here. It says that God, he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of what? Those who diligently seek him. Now, we have been looking at the question in the previous programs about will you choose life? And we saw from Deuteronomy chapter 30 that God has set before us the choice of life or death, blessing or cursing. I took you to Joshua chapter 1. And we saw that in assuming the leadership of Israel, as Joshua prepared to step into Moses' shoes, God gave him the key to success. And he said that you will have to meditate upon the word day and night. I said that meditation is an act of giving attention, focused attention, careful, considerate thought. God was telling Joshua that if you are going to succeed leading Israel in the anointing that Moses walked in, if you are going to fill the shoes of Moses, you are going to have to meditate upon the word day and night. 
Now, when we think about meditation, once again, we've talked about this in the previous programs. Looking at the concept of meditation, meditation, again, is to give careful, considerate thought to a specific subject. When a student studies for a test, they are practicing a form of meditation. They are focusing in on the subject matter on which they will be tested. When a child is playing video games, they are, they are practicing a form of meditation, giving constant focused attention on that game. When you watch a program, you are giving constant, careful attention. You are sitting and not focusing on anything else because you want to catch everything in the script. There are people who have favorite sitcoms and they can tell you everything about the, you know, the, the, this week's most current episode because they've spent so much time thinking about it, considering it, pondering it. What have they been doing? They've been meditating upon it. He says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do we diligently seek God? We do it by giving careful, considerate thought to his word. And as I said before, it's not necessarily a sin to watch a movie or to watch a TV program or to catch up on the day's news. But when you are doing those things, you are practicing a form of meditation. If God told us in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that he set before us life and death. And I hear people say, well, there's nothing really wrong with that program that I'm watching. In a sense, they may be right. But when they are looking at that program, they are not looking at the Word of God. It is up to you how far you go with God. It is up to you how far you reach into the faith of the Son of God. When we talk about growing in faith, we're grow talking about growing in our understanding, our revelation knowledge of the faith of the Son of God and learning how to walk in that faith, how to release that faith. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 tells us that we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead within us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus is now dwelling in the, in the fullness of his personhood inside of us. He will give us revelation knowledge. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's go back and look at that. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And when we look at that, it says again, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Romans chapter 12, it tells us in verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Going back to Galatians chapter 2, the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. How do we receive the faith of the Son of God? In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We receive the faith of the Son of God by hearing the word of the living God. As I've said several times in these programs, the, the printed Bible that we have sitting you know, in our lap or on our coffee table, is a perfect representation of the Word of God, but it does not become the Word of God to you until it gets into your soul. You have to spend time meditating it. You have to spend time giving it careful, considerate thought. God said that he sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing. We have the faith of the Son of God, and we received it by hearing the Word of God, by spending time meditating in the Word of God. If you go over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 23 tells us, or chapter 1 verse 23 tells us, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Notice again that Peter here tells us that the word of God is incorruptible seed. How do we plant that seed? We plant that seed by meditating upon the word of God. As I, as I said earlier in the program, you can spend time meditating upon the day's daily newscasts, on your favorite sitcom. There are people who can tell you every headline. They can tell you everything going on, what this person did, what that person did, because they've spent so time, much time meditating. But then you look at their life. They have the same sicknesses. They have the same issues that their unsaved neighbors have. They don't have peace. They don't have 
you know, prosperity. They, they struggle just like their unsaved neighbors. We should not have to go out and tell people we're Christians. They should be able to see a difference in our life. They should be able to see the power of God flowing through our lives. But because we are not spending our time meditating upon the Word of God, we are not manifesting the power of God. We meditate to manifest. We meditate to demonstrate. We meditate to show forth the power that is already within us. I said previously that the Holy Spirit showed me that we are spending time praying for an outpouring while the world is waiting for an outflowing. You have the power of God within you if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. This week, we are preparing to celebrate Christmas. We are preparing to celebrate the entrance of Jesus through the Virgin Mary into the earth where he was born in a, in a very humble shepherd's cave. Jesus entered into the world as our Savior. And we say, Emmanuel, glory to God. We praise him for that. But what exactly was the purpose of Jesus coming into this earth? We celebrate Christmas, but do we ever really give any thought to it? Jesus entered into this earth as our Savior. He entered in with the sole purpose of going to the cross as the spotless Lamb of God to serve as you and I sacrifice for sin. In Romans chapter 10, it tells us that we it's just a matter of believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. It is as simple as praying a prayer like, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are my Savior. I receive your free gift of redemption and thank you for forgiving my sins. I thank you for pouring out your blood upon the cross. And I just thank you for presenting that blood upon the mercy seat. And I receive you as Savior. And I just give you praise in Jesus' name. Please, if you've never prayed that prayer again, send us an email. Prayer at mbmediaministries.net. Prayer at mbmediaministries.net. But when you prayed that prayer the first time, it was because you heard a message such as what I'm teaching in this video. We hear the Word of God. We see the Word of God. We are a spirit being. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, intellect, and emotions. We live in a body. Our soul is the gateway between the spirit and the physical realm. We take the Word of God. We meditate upon the Word of God. We allow it to get rooted into our soul. Peter called it the incorruptible seed. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gave the parable of the sower. And he talked about four different types of ground. If you study this out and look at it, what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about four different stages of spiritual growth. But I want you to notice in verse 13, Jesus says, first of all, he says unto them, know you not this parable, and how then will you know all parables? Jesus taught this parable to show the disciples, to show the people how the kingdom of God operated. Unfortunately, most people today do not understand this parable. And if you notice, Jesus said, then how then will you know all parables? In a sense, this parable is almost like the Rosetta Stone. In the Rosetta Stone was an artifact that was discovered. It had three different languages on them. One of them was Egyptian hieroglyphics. Before that stone was discovered, they did not understand how to read the hieroglyphics. Two of the three languages have the exact same things written out, and they were known languages. So from that, they were able to interpret and learn how to interpret hieroglyphics. Jesus is telling us the parable of the sower is the Rosetta Stone that tells you how the kingdom of God operates how the faith of the Son of God operates. It operates by seed. That is why Peter called it the incorruptible seed. And then you notice here in Mark chapter 4 and verse 14, it says the sower sows the word. What does the sower do? He sows the incorruptible seed. She sows the incorruptible seed. The word of God is the seed of God. When you did not know Jesus, when you had not yet given your heart to the Lord, you heard the word of God. 
You may have seen the Word of God in a book or in the Bible. Your eyes and your ears are the gateway to the soul. The Word of God is sown into the soul through hearing. And that's what Paul was telling us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The faith of the Son of God comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The unfortunate part is most people do not understand how this works. They do not understand what it means to walk by the faith of the Son of God. If we go back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But notice in verse 2, it says, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are transformed as you meditate. You meditate to gain confidence. You meditate to gain revelation. You give thought, attention, focus to the Word of God. I remember when I was in Bible school, the president of the school talked about how he really enjoyed, as a kid, he enjoyed Western novels. Even as an adult, he enjoyed reading Western novels. And we were all sitting there thinking, well, that sounds great. You enjoy reading Western novels. But then he told us it had been years since he had read one. Because even though he enjoyed reading it, even though the Lord would allow him to read those Western novels, he was more focused in on the Word of God and just did not have time to read the Western novels because he did not want to fill his soul with those things. We often look at ministries like Catherine Kuhlman, Kenneth Hagin, Andrew Womack, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, and think, wow, I would love to walk as they walked. But if you look at their lives, they did not spend time meditating on the worldly things. I remember a story that Lester Summerall shared the first time he went over to Smith Wigglesworth's home. He was a young man at that time in England. It was fashionable to carry an, umbr an umbrella under one arm and to carry a newspaper with you. So he walked up to the door. He knocked on the door. Smith answered the door and said, I will not have that thing in my house and slammed the door in his face. He didn't understand what had happened, but then he realized he had had the paper under his arm. So he took the paper, he put it in a bush, knocked again, and Smith allowed him in. Smith Wigglesworth was said to have only read the Bible his entire life. He gave his attention to the Word of God. He gave his focus to the Word of God. He planted the seed, the incorruptible seed in his soul to the point where that became a part of him. It dominated his life. He would not even allow news headlines into his house. He was totally 100% focused and dedicated on the Word of God. What would your and my life look like if we did the same type of things? If we had that kind of dedication to the Word of God? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by sowing and sowing the Word of God. As we sow the Word of God into our soul, as we look at it, as we listen to it, it is being sown into our soul. As it comes up and begins to take root, we will see our minds begin to be transformed. The word transformed is metamorpho. It is the same type of word that we get metamorphosis from. It describes a picture of what we're talking about here. Is It's like a caterpillar. A caterpillar goes into the cocoon and emerges a beautiful butterfly. What happens? It goes through a process of metamorphosis. And that is what Paul is talking about here. We make Jesus the Lord of our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17, it says, All things become new. All things, the old has passed away. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You, When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, old things passed away. You became a new creation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 tells us that we were created righteous in, in holiness. We are just as righteous today as the moment we walk into heaven. We are just as holy today. We are not working to become more holy. You hear people talk about, you know, that their, their spirit needs to be healed. I have heard people talk about the healing of the spirit, but God, your spirit does not need to be healed because God does not do an incomplete work. 
When you made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit took you. He baptized you into Jesus. He immersed you into Jesus. Your old man, your old sin nature was buried with Jesus, but you arose out of that grave as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are holy. You are righteous. You are accepted in the beloved. We are told in Ephesians chapter 1. You are complete in Christ, but you do not experience or enjoy benefit from what has happened in your spirit because your soul still needs to be transformed. You have the same thought patterns. You, you look the same because your physical being was not changed. Your soul was not changed. Now that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you must take the incorruptible seed of God's word and begin to plant it in your soul. As you do that, and going back to Mark chapter 4, in verse 26, Jesus told the disciples, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first a blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now you might say, Brother Mark, He's talking about the heart. It's sown into the heart. We need to look at the Word of God and, and get an understanding of what the Word of God is talking about. When we talk about the heart of man, we're talking about the center or the core of man or woman. We're talking about the center or the core of your being. The Bible tells us that the spirit and soul are divided as sundered by the Word of God. The heart is sort of like a chicken's egg. When you crack that egg, inside you are going to find egg yolk, and then an egg white. Two different parts, one egg. In the heart, if you crack the heart open, you will find your spirit and your soul. When you, get, when you leave this earth, you will shed your physical body, and your spirit and your soul will enter into glory. So your spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are sealed into Christ. Your spirit is complete. Your spirit is whole. Your spirit is righteous. Your spirit is holy. Your spirit has the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of it. Your spirit does not need to be healed, but your soul needs to be transformed. The soul is the gateway. So, such is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed, as if a man should cast seed, the incorruptible seed, into the ground of his soul, which is the mind, will, intellect, and emotions. That is your job. Your job is not to make change happen. Your job is not to manifest the power. Your job is just to yield to God, place your attention, your focus, your focus and your attention upon the word of God, which we call meditating upon the word day and night. Your job is not to be sitting and, and catching up with all the latest news. Your job is not to be sitting and watching every movie, every sitcom, learning about you know the A-list actors, the B-list actors, whatever type of actors. There are people who are just so fascinating, want to catch up all the, all the headlines. You know, it might be about the actors, the royal family, whatever it might be. These are human beings, just like you or I. They need Jesus just like you or I. Our focus should be upon the Word of God. How much desire do you have to walk in the fullness of everything that God has provided? We take the Word of God, we take that incorruptible seed, we plant it within the soul. Paul tells us the life we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Paul told us that we received the incorruptible seed by hearing, and hearing by the incorruptible seed. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it is the word of God that is the incorruptible seed. It is the word of God that we plant in our heart. As the word of God then begins to grow, Jesus said that we we sleep and rise night and day, and the seed springs up and grows up. We don't need to know how. We don't need to know how this works. We just need to know that the word of God is the incorruptible seed, and as we plant it in our soul and allow it time, we will see change begin to happen. But it is not something we do once. It is not something we do twice, three times. It takes effort. It takes attention. It takes focus upon the Word of God to allow the Word of God to take root and begin to grow up in our hearts. Jesus told the disciples, you don't need to know how this works. You just need to know that if you plant the incorruptible seed, then it will begin to grow. And then the life that you live, you will be living by the faith of the Son of God. Well, our time is up today. 
Thank you for joining me. Carolyn and I love you. We're praying for you. And please, if there's anything that we can join specifically with you in prayer, send us a prayer request. Prayer at mbmediaministries.net. So until the next program, until we are back together, remember Paul's words in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. The life that we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God.